Keith Drury from Indiana Wesleyan University, one of the Wesleyan Church's authorities on holiness, is moderating a, a team of people who've been gathered from all across our denomination. After a sermon or after someone preaches or gives a paper like this, if we were all sitting out there and walking out, we'd say something to each other. What would you say, Ruth, to someone next to you? After, just right, like right now, lean over to the person next to you. What would you say after hearing that? <laughs> I would say that was a, a very helpful reminder of one of the, the things that, that God has given to the Wesleyan Church to, to proclaim. And I would say that um, perhaps I've forgotten in my desire to be accepting of people, which I think God calls us to, perhaps I've forgotten to give the, the additional challenge of complete uh, commitment of oneself to Christ. Edgar? Well, um, I have been working with... Uh, some uh, Hispanic pastors that uh, really uh, don't have a uh, background of holiness. Or maybe, yeah, but uh, uh, background of the Pentecostal way holiness. And uh, uh, one of the uh, attractions that they always have uh, regarding the, the Wellian Church is the theme of the holiness. I have two responses. Number one, I thank God for the wonderful young scholars that we have in the church. What a gift of God it is to us. And secondly, I understand what fuels the optimism of the ministry that God has given to me. What God can do in the life of an individual. And, uh, and that optimism just permeates everything. The, uh, the optimism thing came up, and it's coming up with you. And and you raise it even with people saying, whoa, wait a second, how do I live this? It, is there a, has there been a pessimism prevail that's made holiness harder to sell in the last... You I think? think there has, yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I grew up where, where almost everyone was claiming it. Uh, and, and, and yet you'd look at it as a, young, as a young teenager and you'd think, man, if that's holiness, Jesus is mean, you know? I mean, if that's living like Jesus, he's mean. And, and, and so, you, you, so we tended to like delay that and say, I can't just go down and claim it. And so I think that created a pessimism. And so now a lot of people didn't want to claim it because they saw the label abused by people. Mm -hmm. Joy, do you see a difference between generation like that that he's talking about? What? Well, I do because one of the things that I would uh, struggle with is the fear of claiming it for someone judging me. Uh, oh, she says she's got oh, that yeah. sanctification, but look how she acted um, you know, with her husband or her children. And I think from the mama point of view, you know, we can show out occasionally and they set and look for holiness during those times. Sort of like being a big target. Heck, yeah, it is yeah. We'll target. see. We'll yeah. see. So yeah. it, was, it was for me, I think for years, it was a very quiet experience for fear that others would judge me and I would be put on a pedestal that I couldn't um, stay on. And so I walked it and it was a very sweet experience. And then when the freedom of the, uh, of the Spirit started moving in, I thought, really, it doesn't matter what other people think about me anymore. It's about my relationship with the Lord. And that is a freeing experience like none other. And uh, some of that came under this fellow's teaching. Keith, uh, go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, for me, uh, the pessimism uh, comes uh, from my background. Uh, really, until recently, I haven't heard of the other ways. Hmm. I mean, all I've heard all my life coming from the Pilgrim Holiness Church is the short way. I'm glad there's a default. I've been sanctified. <laughs> I mean, I've gone to the altar hundreds of times and, uh, uh, you know, the short way and uh, failed to live up to the standard. But I'm glad there's a default that's been a liberating <laughs> lecture this afternoon that uh, if the short one don't work, I mean, at least there's the... Uh, <laughs> there's even a longer but, one. Uh, that one uh, think, uh, the, uh, the pessimism comes in that in my background, as I grew up in the Pilgrim Holiness Church, it has been presented as a, it's, it's prescription, as a prescription rather than descriptive. And, 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 and going through the yes. material, it has been presented in such a way that it's, it's uh, spawned, uh, it spawned uh, uh, legalism, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, exclus exclusiveness, and sometimes, unfortunately, uh, 
a holier-than-thou attitude, you know, where I've sanctified you guys and not, you know. Ed raises this thing that we need to get into here and just interrupt each other, kind of more like McLaughlin group. No, here it is. Just go ahead, jump yeah. in. I so identify um, with and that. And so, John, j jump yeah. in with that. It, yeah. it, is this talk say that kind of Wesleyans have a kind of multiple choice now or... I hope there so. are kind of three <laughs> or four. I mean, or that, that's, that's really yeah. what it. Or this one doesn't work. You back up with this. What, what's this? What's this address say? <laughs> well, I was I was raised like you, so steeped in the short way. I spent more time at the altar as a child and as a teenager, yeah. and through my twenties, trying to get sanctified, and and I became the ultimate pessimist. I just gave up on it mm. until I found some of this liberating truth like we're hearing today, some of it from you back there in the 80s and from you, and uh, it's just such a freeing thing. To, I felt so restricted by hearing only, it has to be this way, get up here, if you're not sanctified, come tonight, get sanctified, and leaving the altar feeling, well, whatever it was, I didn't get it, I give up. What did I do wrong? Yeah. What, is, there, is, there, is there something going on, Ruth, speak to this, is there something going on in the Wesleyan Church that isn't... Uh, official doctrine change, but is in fact a grassroots broadening of the ways. I mean, when he says there are three Wesleyan ways, he means pan-Wesleyan. He admits that, that kind of the discipline still is the shorter way, mm -hmm. although you can interpret it the, the middle way. You, you can interpret it that way. Is, there, is, is that change happening? Of those three ways, for, or Keswick, if you want to put in four, if you were to make a pie, what would you say the Wesleyan Church pastors and laymen are? It's hard to me to make, how I find it difficult to make an official proclamation. Let me just speak for myself. Yeah. Um, I think that one thing that I find difficult is to prescribe that God's grace will work in a particular way in a person's ah. life. Yeah. Because God is God. And God's grace is always drawing people to himself. And we, because of God's grace, can choose to to walk away or to, to take a, a detour. So I think one of the beauties of having some options is a recognition that God's grace is always drawing us to himself. God is a God who seeks. God is a God who seeks. Um, sometimes we're not seeking him, and so we walk away. And so this, this, this variety of, of options, so to speak, perhaps you could put it that way, is a recognition that God works in different ways in different people's time, lives in God's time. And um, he graciously continues to call us to himself. Okay. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth now laid it out here. That he said it in the paper. He says God used all three ways to bring three people to enter, into our sanctification. God doesn't change, but his methods change. Do you think God's changing methods and how people get into I don't think I don't think God's changing methods. As I've thought about this, we try to diagnose how God is working. Then we try to define how God's working. Then we try to confine how God works. Mm -hmm. And That'll God, by His very nature, can break all that. of our rules. <laughs> he can break all of our rules and do what He chooses to do in light of the particular needs of a particular person. And uh, I don't think we can prescribe always how God is going to work. And so so you would go. you say we need to be keeping our eyes out to how God is bringing people into a spirit-filled, holy life and, yeah. and talk need, about that? And we need to be open. And respect that, go, yes. and respect the way that he speaks to other people within the boundaries, I think, of our own tradition. But also uh, not go on a guilt trip, John, when, when those things happen, realizing that maybe God speaks to us in a way that's consistent with our personality and with our own history. I mean, we all come out of things. We can't pretend that there's, that there's just one pure bolt of revelation dropped and we got to get it right. That, that truth wraps itself around culture and around bodies, and around personalities, and around limitations. And, and so that, that's what I heard. I heard a versatility that allows each of us to interpret what God is doing, the same thing he's doing, but interpret it in a way consistent with our, our own walk. He used the whole, go ahead, jump in. Uh, well, well, I think I agree with, with you uh, entirely. Uh, one of the things that I... Uh, until I came across this paper, uh, understanding those different views uh, was a key. I mean, up until this point, I mean, uh, I did not know there were other ways. And having worked with DBMD, of course, uh, you know, with District Board of Ministerial oh, Development, boy. we only know one 
I mean, you either have the short way or, uh, I'm sorry, you have to take the class all over again, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, that's right, that's right. So, so uh, I think a key is, uh, uh, you know, having understanding of these different views. Yeah. And uh, we just need to do a better job probably, uh, you know, dispersing or dispensing. But there are individuals that um, I would be in church with or um, working with, and I would be, put, we would be pushing each other, but then they would get to a point where they were satisfied in the relationship with the Lord. That would frustrate me. And then those same frustrations would bring about what someone called temptation to say, well, you know, judging. And I don't want to judge yeah. someone, but when someone straight up says, you know, I really don't want to put that kind of effort in, I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure they got the first dose if, uh, they, yeah. if they don't want the second. They don't want the second. <laughs> or their dose didn't taste like my yeah, dose. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I, I wonder sometimes if that isn't the absence of the testimony or the, 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 the proclamation of individuals who talk about their own relationship with God mm -hmm. yeah. that creates a hunger. Wow, that's what I want. Right. That are further along. And the absence of that and the absence of, of, of context in which to communicate that doesn't create that hunger that makes you want to pursue that. Or, or if in the salvation process they were not, and I mean it's hard because we weren't there, but it, it's possible to be saved of, like out of something. I want to be free from something but never be turned on toward Jesus Christ. I mean, it seems to me the initial act of salvation is that we become preoccupied with, with one person. And if that's not there, that's what seems like that's what's missing. And sometimes we're trying to get away from problems in our lives, and uh, we can do that, even using religion, without necessarily being preoccupied with Jesus. There are a bunch of terms he's used, and he kind of pressed every single button of every person that has a term there. What's the term? I mean, these terms have changed through history. What's the term for this experience that best works today in your context? What, what do you say? Is it entire sanctification, perfect love, eradication, deeper life, upper room, whatever all those other lists he had? I think or there's... What new term? There's two words that I use pretty consistently whenever I try to discuss it. One is the word freedom. I think everybody desires to be free, but they find themselves entrapped to sins that they can't get free from. Chris defined it at the beginning of the, the uh, paper. So when you say you can be finally free, that resonates. The other word is the word wholeness, because I think our culture has so many broken lives. And so when you say to people, do you want to be whole? And I think that connects. It doesn't There's come a, from our tradition, but I, I love the phrase, fully devoted follower of Christ. And he mentioned that in his paper, yeah. too, didn't yeah, he? I Fully devoted yeah, follower of Christ. Yeah, that's yeah. a great thing. And a word that, I, that I'm becoming more uh, comfortable with is healing. Yeah. yeah. I believe that it touches the basic dysfunctional levels of our lives and brings healing into our lives whenever we have that release to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that we're not using anti-sin words, right? I mean, like cleanse. Yeah, all three of those. Four. Yeah. Those, those are, are all not. positive. Um, portrayals. Yeah. Of it is. Sin is implied because it's the absence of sin that creates these things, but it's not, I mean, Wesley's own words, uh, to love the Lord your God, says nothing about sin, it talks about love. Yeah. Our, our brother talked a moment ago about, about the, the old legalism or the old, yeah. the old yeah. way, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it is more about becoming than it is about not doing. Uh, I think my generation mishandled this whole area. And I think what we would call in our circles, in, in our church, the emerging generation, is much more in tune with holiness and with the pursuit of this doctrine than we were. And that part of what we did is we replaced building the church for releasing the believers to become like Jesus. And this present younger generation is recapturing the vision of releasing people to be like Christ and not just building an organization mm -hmm. and churches. It's a great segue to our last four minutes or so. Let's think about the future. You've talked about the coming generations, the emerging mm -hmm. generations. Uh, if we were the general conference and general superintendents and general board and general board of review, just us, wouldn't that be nice? But we're not. But let's, <laughs> we got four minutes, four minutes before you resign. 
<laughs> what, what would we, what, what are the next steps? Let's, let's pretend that this afternoon session was really a turning point in this matter of holiness. I'll and we had the power to, what do we do next as a denomination? What has to come out of this afternoon session for the future of a denomination? Ruth? I think our, our choice of terms is very important, um, that they, they be terms that are clearly understood. One thing that struck me in the paper that I want to mention as well is acknowledging that um, Works of mercy, ministries of compassion, can be a means of grace. And I think it's an amazing thing that uh, when we minister to those in need, it's, it is as if we are ministering to Jesus, and Jesus works in our lives through them. So part of it, perhaps, could be affirming the way young adults are looking for purpose and involvement around the world, not just our local neighbors, but around the world, and, and supporting that as, as an avenue to, okay, to say. Okay, carefully picking terms sort of incorporating that compassion ministry as a part of the living it kind of stuff? What else, what else comes up? Yeah, I think uh, papers like this one, presentations like this one, discussions like this one need to happen. I've been in, at Bethany six of my last seven years, and I think they need to hear papers like this and read things like this and discuss things like this because I think a result, you raised the question I think two or three minutes ago, well, what, where are our pastors out there or whatever? And, and I think there's a, a vague non-teaching of this whole doctrine. I yeah. think it's largely kind of just you hear people out at the local church level saying we're not hearing it. Yeah. Okay, and last one, yeah, Steve. What one thing needs to come out, next step out of this? Um, admit it. I, I, people that have it, admit it. Um, because there's so many closet sanctified people. They're afraid if they come out, they're going to get shot <laughs> at. And I, So just admit it without stopping. And press on. Okay, give these people a hand. They've done a good job.